I have all 12 of those transistors replaced on here. The dull colored ones are those Fairchild ones and these two shiny ones. These are the international rectifier for transistors. I would have liked to have them all matching because that is important here. However, the specs in all of these are pretty similar, so this is what I'll do since I did not have 12 identical transistors. I also tried to test this out. I have it connected up here to a, a test setup, but it doesn't work. Uh, there's still some other problems with this inverter besides these transistors, and I'm going to get into that here uh, in a little bit. However, first I would like to just give a general overview of how this boost circuit works. I believe in my Whistler inverter, inverter repair video, I covered the output stage uh, in some cursory detail at least. This time I'm going to talk about the boost stage, since that is what is not working in this inverter. I believe the output stage, which is over here, is working just fine. So it should just be the input stage over here that needs some work. Now I had mentioned before that the boost stage of a sine wave inverter like this one is pretty much identical to the boost stage of any other inverter on the market. Modified sine wave, sine wave, whatnot. It's all the same. <clears throat> There's really nothing special about it. They all work the same. The only real difference is that in a pure sine wave inverter, these output bulk caps are charged up to somewhere around 200 volts. In a modified sine wave inverter, they're only charged to maybe 150 volts. So there is a slight difference there, but that voltage difference doesn't really have any cost implications or any design implications. It's still all the same stuff. So basically you have your input power coming in through these input cables. These two big ferrites on here, one on each cable, that's just there for radiated emissions. It doesn't actually help the performance of the unit in any way. It's just to pass FCC regulations for radio frequency interference for television radio, that sort of thing. And these probably only cost uh, 15 to 30 cents each um, when you buy them in bulk, so they're not that expensive. If you don't like them, you can just remove them, but I'd recommend keeping them. They go through these, the positive goes through these 40 amp automotive blade style fuses, and these do have fuse holders on them, so kudos power bright. They didn't solder them directly to the board. I like that. <clears throat> it then goes into this big bank of 12 volt capacitors. Once again, they didn't did not use 16 volt capacitors like some inverters do. These are 25 volt, so thanks once again, power bright. However, the name brand is not good, so I still don't especially like these caps, but there's a lot of them and they're 25 volts, so that is good. Now the positive and negative from the battery, they come into here and you can see these two metal bus bars. Basically they just connect right to here. Now this is full current, 200 amps or so from your battery, so the printed circuit board can't carry 200 amps. It just doesn't have enough current carrying capabilities. So they add these bus bars in here to spread the current out so they can get everywhere that it needs to go. Now the positive lead, after it runs through the fuses, that gets tied to the center tap of these three transformers. The output stage of them is connected up in series, the input in parallel, I'll cover that more later. But the input basically has three terminals, a center tap which is connected directly to the positive terminal of the battery through the fuses, and these transistors over here alternately pull either side of that center tap to ground. And that creates an alternating current that the transformer can use to boost up the voltage. Now there are three transformers, there are 12 transistors. Simple math and simple logic dictates that there are four transistors then for each of these transformers. Two for one tap, two for the other tap. So when these two are active, this transformer, this side of this transformer gets pulled to ground. When these two are active, this side gets pulled to ground and it just alternates, probably at around 50 kilohertz. I haven't measured it, but it should be somewhere in that range. Now all three of these are connected up in parallel on the input. The output, since these are isolation transformers, are connected up in series. So each of these transformers on the primary side sees one-third of 200 amps, approximately, meaning each of these transistors sees one-sixth of 200 amps. <clears throat> The output is up, connected up in series, that boosts the voltage times 3, so you get 200 volts approximately out of here. From these transformers it is approximately 50 kilohertz alternating current, and nobody wants a 50 kilohertz square wave 200 volt signal that's useless. 
So what they do with the alternating current coming out of these is they run them through some diodes that you can't see, but they are under here. And they are simply a standard bridge rectifier for diodes. Now the output current of these transformers is, since it's at 200 volts instead of 12 volts, it's relatively low, 10 amps or so under full load. So just four simple transistors over, or four simple, simple diodes over here can handle that current without any problem. That's only 20 watts or so of power loss. Not an issue. So they just bring, send that through a bridge rectifier through this choke over here. And there are technical reasons why this has to exist. They're kind of beyond the scope of this discussion, but it goes through that rectifier, through this transform, this uh, choke, and gets dumped into these output caps. Now, I have no idea what Junzel brand capacitors are, but at least they're 250 volt capacitors. So, good enough, I guess. I think they still work. And this is the end of the input stage. You get 200 volts DC. The rest of this inverter over here, that's all the output side where you get your sine wave out. This is the boost stage. <clears throat> a general overview, at least, of how it works. Now, I did leave out one very important component of it, and that is something has to drive these transistors. That's the only real smarts of the boost circuit whatsoever. Something has to drive these. And that drive circuit is over here. Since my camera doesn't focus on the fly, I'm going to get as close as I can, and then we'll talk about that. And this right here, in this section of the board, that really is the entire smarts for controlling all of these transistors over here. There's very little to it. Now in some of the very low cost inverters, all they have controlling these is a self-resonant circuit, usually epitaxial BJTs, just a couple of them, uh, four actually. And uh, basically those are left over from CRT television days of trying to use them up. It's probably practically free to get those components. And because it's consumer grade, they don't really care about the quality or any of that sort of thing. Uh, just as long as it works well and if it ship out the door, that's all they care about because what's cheap sells. That's all consumers usually care about. Cheap, cheap, cheap. In this case, they did something a little bit better. They have this control IC. It's from TI. Uh, the part number isn't that important, but it's just a PW PWM control IC with some feedback. And it has two output channels, and those channels drive these transistors. So they did it a much better way in this case, and I applaud them for that. This is actually a reliable way to do it. The self-resonant circuit may not work properly when it gets very cold or very hot or whenever it feels like not working properly. Uh, this should always work. So I do like the way that this is set up. It's still a little bit kludgy in the way that they chose to drive it, but it, uh, it should be okay. Now, the reason that I started looking at this next when it didn't work is because when all of these transistors fried, basically all of the gates of these transistors, the gate turns, turns it on and off, just goes through this little 10 ohm resistor, and there's one resistor for each transistor, and that runs into this drive circuit over here. And 10 ohms isn't very much. You send 12 volts through 10 ohms, you get an amp, an amp times six resistor, six transistors, that's six amps potentially, and that can easily damage this circuitry over here, which isn't designed for that kind of current. So I suspected right away that this drive circuitry was damaged in some way, and I started looking at this, trying to figure out what wasn't working. I don't have a real oscilloscope that I can use, so I just used my multimeter and uh, general knowledge of how this must work to try to figure this out. And I haven't done any repairs yet, but I just wanted to kind of describe what I'm looking at here. So this is the drive circuitry. This is right here. These three components basically drive one bank of the transistors. These three components drive the other. This chip here has two output channels. They're open collector. So they only pull the voltage up to 12 volts to drive. They don't pull it down to zero. This circuitry here pulls it down to zero. And without getting too complicated, basically this guy here is just a diode, this is a 1 kilo ohm resistor, and this here is either a BJT, <coughs> bipolar junction transistor, or a field effect transistor. It could be either one. And if you draw out the schematic, I'm not exactly sure which, it's either a PNP, BJT, or it is a P-channel FET. Either one could conceivably work in circuit. I suspect it is a PNP transistor, and I don't have a SOT23 P-channel FET on hand, however I do have PNP transistors, so I'm going to try to replace these. Now with my ohmmeter, I've determined that this one over here is the bad one, it's shorted. 
This one is probably okay, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm going to try to replace this particular transistor with a PNP transistor I have on hand, and then I'm going to try the circuit again. And hopefully it then works. Oh yeah, look at that awesomeness right there. Yeah, I didn't have a SOT233 package transistor. However, I did have a TO92 tall pack, so I just put that in there. It performs the same function, and it should work just fine. Still no worky. So, I replaced the other transistor as well. Once taken out of circuit, that one tested bad too, in a different way, but still bad. So, if it doesn't work now, then it's probably that control I see that has its output buffers blown up. And that's very possible, but I'll give this a try and see if that works. It looks like I may have had success this time. It at least turns on and doesn't overload my 10 amp breaker over here. So I'm going to leave it connected up this way through a couple of alligator clips, very thin, but I just wanted to uh, let you in on the first time fire up of this thing with hopefully the repairs. You may notice here that I don't have the heatsink on once again. Last time I didn't do that, the transistors went up in smoke, so you may wonder why I'm doing it this way. Well, there's two reasons. One, I don't know if it works, and I don't want to have to take this all apart again. And two, I do have a couple of mismatched transistors in here, and I want to monitor those to see if they get hotter than the rest of them, or if everything seems okay, assuming that this thing actually runs. So let's plug in the power and see what happens. So far, so good. No current draw. I'll turn the switch on. And we have half an amp of current draw. And no volts out. That's not what I was hoping. Hmm. Well, this may not be fixed after all. I guess I'll have to look at this a little bit more. There is still definitely something wrong with it. Well everyone, sorry to do this to you, but I think I'm going to have to end the video here because this is how it goes sometimes. It doesn't always work out like you plan. And I got two inverters. One of them, the 1500 watt one, seems to be repaired. I have to go through and stress test it and test its capabilities and such to make sure that it's durable before I do anything else with it. But at least it seems to function. This one does not. I've replaced both of these drive transistors that drive the FET gates, and those seem to be working all right. However, this control I see down here, the output stage of that, the two open collector outputs, those don't seem to function, and it also gets quite warm when I power it up. So I need a new one of those, TL594, either by TI or on semi, equivalent parts. I don't have one of those, and if I purchase one, if you buy onesies on the internet, you're paying a dollar for the part, and shipping is probably ten bucks if they even allow a minimum order as small as a dollar, so I'm going to see if I can get one of these parts some other way, free samples or something, and that'll probably be a few weeks before I have those in. I'm not going to wait that long to finish this video, so I'm going to end it here. One inverter works, one doesn't, and this is just how it goes sometimes. Thanks for watching.